Commission for May 4, 2017 to order. Can I get a roll call from members, please? Dirk Bowden. Here. Alan Bucknam. Present. Emery Dorsey. Here. Donna Kimsey. Here. Janet Leo. Here. Scott Ohm. Here. Amanda Weaver. Vivian Voss. Here. The next order on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there a motion to prove the order of the agenda? I move to uh, approve the order of the agenda today. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Call for a vote. Motion passed eight to zero. Is there a motion to approve the order of minutes for the March 16, 2017? I make the motion to approve the minutes for March 16th. So there's a second. second. Any discussion? Call for a vote. Motion passed seven to zero with one abstaining. This is the time for any person to speak on any subject not appearing on tonight's agenda. Is there anybody signed up to speak? Seeing none, I would close the public forum and let's move on to the public hearing. I open the public hearing for case number MS 16-08, an ordinance, an application filed by Wazi Partners LLC for approval of minor subdivision to replat the property from five parcels to two lots for property zone mixed use commercial located at the northwest corner of 38th Avenue and Upham Street and ask for the staff report. Commissioner, good evening for the record. Lauren Mikulak, uh, planner with the Community Development Department. Um, I am presenting the case tonight, MS 1608, and I would like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, the subdivision regulations, and this presentation. So noted. Thank you. Um, property is within the city of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met, so you do have jurisdiction to hear this case. Um, we'll start with just an aerial of the property to get everybody oriented. If we could have the lights turned down just a little bit out here, thank you. Um, so north is to the top of the screen. You can see Wadsworth um, in pink just off to the left of the screen, 38th Avenue, moving east to west. And the subject property is outlined in blue. It's a little bit of an irregular shape, just shy of four acres in size. Um, this aerial is from 2016, and the conditions on the site have changed even since then. Um, you can see there had been um, a single family home and a few accessory structures. Those have since been demolished. Um, they became an attractive nuisance, essentially, after they were vacated. Um, the building with the white roof here on the northern end of the property was built in the um, 1960s. It's an auto-oriented, auto-repair um, type building. And then the structure uh, to the left is the Vector Bank building. So the bank occupies that, but they also have a few offices in there. And you can see sort of the surrounding land use patterns, the Safeway Shopping Center um, off to the northwest, Stevens Elementary to the east, um, and then a variety of smaller format um, commercial uses along 38th Avenue as it extends um, to the east. This is an excerpt from the city's zoning map. So all of those blue colors represent mixed use zone districts, the lighter blue um, is mixed-use commercial, and that's the zoning on the subject property. That area, all of this um, mixed-use commercial and more off the screen along Wadsworth was part of the city's legislative rezoning of the Wadsworth corridor in 2011. That darker blue color is a mixed-use neighborhood zone district. Again, um, a city-initiated rezoning of that corridor in 2012. The other colors that you see represent other zone districts. The orange is there are three residential three is a multifamily zone district. Um, a pocket here of R2, although that's on the ball fields for the school. Um, C1 is a standard commercial zone district. 
Uh, mixed use essentially is a zone district that encourages but does not require mixed use development, allows a variety of residential uses, commercial, service, retail. Um, as you know, the case you're hearing tonight is a subdivision, so it won't change the zoning or the uses, but we like to provide this for context. Um, a couple photos of the site. It's a large property, um, so it's a little awkward to photograph, but I think most of us are pretty familiar with it. So in this image, we're looking northwest from 38th Avenue, and you can see that existing two-story Vector Bank building. Um, and another image standing at the, the corner of the property looking north down Upham. Upham doesn't have um, public improvements along the southern half of the property, so you can see the edge of asphalt, no curb gutter, sidewalk. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the giant transformer here on the corner, that will have to get relocated if the site uh, moves forward with redevelopment. You can see in the background that blue um, auto service building that's still on the property. Um, so just a, a quick reminder of what a subdivision does and doesn't do. Um, it's essentially a process by which we create developable land. So. Um, remove or create property lines. We look at the adjacent right-of-way to see if it meets city standards. Um, we evaluate civil documents during the subdivision process, so traffic studies, drainage reports. We look at easements. Um, as I mentioned, it doesn't affect the zoning. It doesn't look at permitted uses, and it doesn't look at site design, which we know can be a challenge when you're trying to understand how a plot relates to what will be coming in the future. This property will have um, the purpose of the subdivision is for redevelopment, so all the buildings on the site would be um, removed and new structures are proposed. We will be reviewing and are reviewing um, site plans and construction plans by staff. Uh, it's been a couple years in the making, so in 2015, City Council and the Urban Renewal Authority reviewed a redevelopment agreement. So there's a lot of components to a redevelopment. Tonight, we're just looking at the subdivision. Um, and with that, we'll just jump right into that document. It's four pages. Um, this is the first page, and it's our standard notes, um, certification, signature blocks, legal description, vicinity map, um, pretty standard across all subdivisions that we review. The second sheet is not one that you see quite as commonly, um, but it's essentially been provided to provide some clarity for the legal description. It shows in the um, graphical portion the boundary of the property in relation to the um, section, quarter section grid, essentially the grid that the entire country is sort of surveyed off of. Um, the third and fourth sheets are where we put a lot of our focus in terms of our review. Uh, this sheet is showing the existing conditions. So I've highlighted a few of the elements that I want to point out. Um, currently, the property is comprised of five different parcels. Uh, in the zoning code, um, a, five, uh, a subdivision that includes five lots, parcels, or tracks is re reviewed only by the Planning Commission. So you will be making the final decision tonight. This won't go forward to City Council. We look at that number at the beginning or the end. In this case, we're going from five um, parcels to two, so it's considered a minor subdivision plot. This sheet essentially officially removes those interior lot lines that are traversing the site and removes the easements that have existed but aren't appropriate for the future redevelopment scenario. This is the fourth sheet, so the boundary um, looks the same, but what this sheet does is create the new lot lines and easements, so we'll zoom in a little bit and walk through what those um, proposed designs are. So again, I've highlighted um, the boundary of the subdivision and the lots that are being created. This will create two lots, so a larger one that's a little bit irregular, but better than it was before by removing those interior lot lines. Um, that larger lot is about 2.8 acres in size. The smaller lot, lot two, has frontage here on 38th Avenue and is about a quarter of an acre in size. And then the other component that's created here is a tract. Tract A um, essentially provides, primarily provides access through the site. Um, we use tracts to create land areas that are not developable for buildings, but have some other specific purpose. So you may have read among the many notes on the first two pages, um, tract A is called out specifically for the purpose of providing access, utilities, and streetscape amenities. 
Um, so it connects to 38th Avenue, and what's not highlighted, highlighted on here, um, but is immediately west of the site, is another access easement that um, this property and the Safeway Shopping Center can both use. So there's a logical terminus there. <clears throat> um, this gray shading, again, um, talking about access easement. So track day is encumbered to provide access. The hammerhead type shape um, on the top here is an emergency access easement, so not intended for all public use. Public can sort of come and go through here. Uh, another easement that has been created on here is a detention easement. The drainage um, stormwater runoff will be accommodated, proposed to be accommodated by an underground detention facility. We always put drainage facilities in an easement to ensure that they're not modified in the future um, and to ensure they're maintained correctly. The city reserves the right to maintain it if it's not maintained in the future through that easement. Um, and then what's shaded in red now is the right-of-way dedication. So I think I mentioned anytime we get a subdivision application, we look at the adjoining streets and see if they meet minimum, current minimum standards. In this case, I think you saw in the image, for example, Upham doesn't have curb gutter or sidewalk. Um, even the frontage on 38th Avenue doesn't meet our minimum standards. So we do request that all of those public improvements to the back of sidewalk be included in city right-of-way. Um, this right away looks a little bit unusual um, because we're trying to clean up the title to the property um, by, by sort of over-dedicating, if you will. The area that's now hatched in black is actually extending all the way to the center line of 38th and Upham, so the middle of the street. Those two areas um, in the city mapping system we show as being right away, but the mechanism by which they were created as right away, it was a little atypical. So one, I believe, a couple of them are listed as roadway easements, um, and 38th Avenue was originally, our record show was originally dedicated through a journal of the Jefferson County Commissioners um, that, that's not as easy to locate. So out of sort of an abundance of caution, the entire air frontage of those two streets all the way to the center line is being dedicated sort of once and for all um, to clear the title and to make sure there's no confusion in the future. That little hole that you see, the exception parcel, that was dedicated very clearly and correctly in 1990, so um, this is not shaded in red for that reason. <clears throat> Um, any subdivision, any land use application, including a subdivision, is sent on referral. As you know, we're not a full service city. So we send these documents out to um, our other utility agencies and service providers. And you can see here just a quick summary of the comments that we get back. As I mentioned, a subdivision is an early step in a redevelopment process. So it's not atypical for utilities to request ongoing coordination. You, you see a recommended condition relative to that. Um, no, no issues from the fire district, no comments from water. If we don't get a, um, we tell utility agencies, if you don't give us comments, we assume you have no concern. So um, it's not uncommon for us to not get a response at this stage in the game. Um, Public Works has approved the plat, and with me tonight is Dave Brassman, our development review engineer, if we have questions from him from a technical perspective. Um, ultimately, though, we are recommending approval of the subdivision. All the agencies can serve the property, and the plat uh, does meet all the technical requirements of the subdivision regulations. We are recommending two pretty standard conditions. Um, the, any new development will be required to construct public improvements, so curb, gutter, sidewalk, drainage, and those obligations are traditionally outlined in a subdivision improvement agreement, so that would be required before the plat gets recorded. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, utility coordination is sort of an ongoing process. So if, for example, um, there needed to be any modification to a utility easement, um, those can happen by separate document, but if we know about it before the plot gets recorded, we always want more information on the plot than less, just because it's an easy place to go for all of that type of information. Um, I believe that's the end of my comments, so I'm happy to answer any questions. As I mentioned, Dave is here, and we also have the applicant in the audience. If you have questions for them. Thank you. Commissioner Bowden? No comments or questions. Commissioner Bowden? Uh, I think it's uh, pretty straightforward, but I just, just because I'm really curious about that exception parcel, what's the story behind that dedication from 1990? Do you have any info on that? 
the 1990 story, I think, is pretty straightforward. Um, do you, do you want to give that background? You probably. In 1990, we apparently needed to construct some ADA ramps at that corner, and um, we approached the property owner at that time, and, and we got that dedication by correct methods. Um, just to back up just a step here with what Ms. Michalak was talking about with respect to the right-of-way, the right-of-way on Upham Street was actually a series of um, right-of-way and roadway easements. So it wasn't really a right-of-way conveyance of title. It was just a grant to construct a, a roadway there, which means the underlying land still belongs to the applicant. So with this subdivision, we're trying to clean that up and, and actually bring it into the public realm. Then they can quit paying taxes on it and, and things like that. Great. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, thanks. Uh, no other questions? Commissioner Christie? Commissioner Kimsey? Oh, no questions. Commissioner Voss? I had a couple, please. And this may speak to the developer. Um, page three, referring to public improvements, including streetscape improvements. Do we have a definition of what the streetscape improvements are going to be, or is that later? Um, it usually comes later, but streetscape improvements typically includes um, a sidewalk, maybe attached, maybe detached, depending on the type of street. Uh, amenity zone could be lawn, could be hardscape, street trees, benches, um, lights. Though the design of the streetscape would be shown in the civil construction plans. We've gotten the first review of that, um, but they're not final by any means at this point in time. In this case, Part of the sidewalk on Upham will be attached. Um, the amenity zone on 38th would be hardscape. So we know some of those details, but it sort of varies by site. Is it seen, who's it seen by, or when does it become public, or how does that work? Um, the, I mean, the first version that we've seen is certainly public document. It gets reviewed by both community development and public works. So it's on the website, or their Not papers? on the website, but okay. cer certainly something we could provide. Mm -hmm. Okay. and then. Uh, the on-street parking uh, of a man, 38th, what's the reason for needing that? The reason for needing it? Mm -hmm. um, well, the zoning code certainly allows and kind of encourages on-street parking in an area that we want to be more walkable and have um, a more dense mix of uses. In this case in particular, we know it's going to be a pretty tight site, and so any, any additional parking that would be available is seen as a positive. So the right-of-way dedication is wide enough to accommodate um, not only the travel lanes on the sidewalks, but also the width of what on-street parking would be. And I assume for retail that's probably going in there that they would want some kind of close parking. Yeah, presumably, mm -hmm. yep. So the market would demand that, would sort of demand that. We don't designate on-street parking for any specific use or user, so it may be that just like the oh, teachers okay. at the school are using it, but mm -hmm. certainly it's viewed as a positive. Okay, and then I think the last one is, I wasn't able to visualize that striping to accommodate two southbound turning lanes. Sure. Um, do we have something on that? We don't have that design, but maybe I can show you on the aerial. Um, probably too zoomed out, but right now essentially Upham is a northbound and a southbound lane and as we get more development in the area and sort of all along 38th Avenue, we know that left turns on 38th Avenue are challenging, especially at certain times of the day. So the more that you can provide um, just a car length or two, sort of a right turn bypass lane right here. So if somebody's waiting to go left, then a car or two can still get by and just go right. So we don't have that right now. We'll stripe it um, to make it clear that it's not for parking, um, but that it's just a bypass if you're waiting behind somebody trying to turn left. And that's within the existing? It will be in that right away area. Mm -hmm. And within, yeah, exactly, the asphalt. All right, thank Does you. Does that help? Yeah. Commissioner Liu? No questions. Commissioner Weaver? Thank you. Um, would the applicant like to come forward if, if you want to make a presentation? It's, it's up to you, or if you think uh, Ms. Mikulik has done a, had a good job, we can. It's, it's entirely up to you. Yes, uh, we're 
here with uh, ourselves, Wazi Partners, Chris and Tyler Downs, and then the Vectra Bank uh, folks are here as well. So if you have any questions, we don't have any prepared remarks, uh, but happy to answer any questions uh, could, that could, you have of us. Yeah, could we get your name and address for the record? Sure. Uh, Tyler Downs, 1255 South Fillmore, Denver. Thank you. Do any of the commissioners have any questions for the applicant? Commissioner Bone. Um, in the report, a uh, garage was uh, mentioned on the northern part of lot one. Um, is that a, you know, conceptually, is that a subterranean or a standalone garage? And where does that sit in relation to the stormwater detention easement? Sure. It, it sort of sits on top of the stormwater. Uh, the stormwater detention is a subterranean hall. Okay. And the, the parking garage is a two story above grade. Uh, precast concrete parking deck, and on two sides it is wrapped by uh, apartments, and then on two sides it's open, um, so that it's not mechanically ventilated. Uh, That's it. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess just this this probably is related to that uh, that structure. I'm just um, looking at the the emergency access easement, kind of on the north side there. That little that little T that comes off of. Uh, uh, I guess would that be Vance Street that, that feeds into the the Safeway lot there? Yeah, that that upper that upper kind of T in the gray on the the northwest is that is is that easement there to allow for access to that parking structure off to the I guess east of that, or is it for another purpose? Access, so fire service so they can get their truck around to service the back side of the structure okay. that and then you contain anything over there. But there are two uh, entrances and exits to the parking garage. Um, one is on the up and side and then one is from that side by the hammerhead uh, very north part of the site. Okay. So basically north of north of where the property line is yeah. over on the northwest side. Okay. All right. No, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I was just, I had some questions as to what the purpose was for that. If, if it was just emergency services or if there was some, some access that was going to be used by the tenants and so forth. So that's, that's clear enough for me. Thanks. Commissioner Dorsey. My question was, uh, when we uh, changed the actual zoning on this, uh, we did have some renderings of what you thought you'd like to have. And Vectra Bank was going to relocate, of course, which this uh, be on the corner, I guess. Uh, the this this um, water faucet looking uh, thing off of uh, thirty eight is is that is that block there where Vectra Banks going to be? Yes. And then Lots. how is their drive through going to work there? I'd be, be happy to show you. Um, we, we brought a, a, a plan view of the, of the site plan, a top-down view. Okay. And I'd like to remind everyone tonight we were just approving. Right. Flat. Right. But we're, we're happy to just, provide any, well, any questions. But there was mention in here about uh, the drive through, and I was just curious about that. Did you have any more questions, Commissioner Dorsey? No. Commissioner Kimsey? No questions. Commissioner Boss? I have one clarification. Is the parking garage public or just for the housing? Um, both. Oh, okay. Um, the, there will be a um, the number 
of stalls inside the parking garage that will um, accommodate retail uses. So to the extent you are shopping in any of the retail um, establishments, and then there will also be some dedicated uh, parking for Vectra Bank uh, in there as well. So the, the first floor um, will actually be open to retail customers, and then there'll be a, a private gate, and then behind that gate is where all the residents will park. So both. Where's the parking for Vector Bank if you want to physically go inside? Um, they have, again, happy to show you here. Any other questions? For Commissioner Leo? Commissioner Weaver? I have no questions. Thank you. I will now open up the citizens forum. Are there any citizens that have signed up to speak? Please come to the podium and give us your name and address for the record. Good evening, my name is Britta Fisher. That's F-I-S-H-E-R and I'm the executive director of Local Works. <clears throat> so I'm here in the unusual position of being somebody who would potentially be displaced by this project and solidly in favor of it. <laughs> um, so our office is currently located in the Vectra Bank building and when Vectra is moved up to 38th Avenue, uh, it'll be just a bank only location. And so it won't have additional office suites. So we'll be looking for a different home and we're pleased to do that. Um, we think that this project overall is very supportive of the neighborhood revitalization strategy vision that laid out uh, that we need more people to support our retail and I think that uh, the two Downses, Tyler and Chris, have done a great job of being engaged with the business community uh, and with the community at large. Uh, they've taken time to get to know the community, they've been a part of our tours and events, um, They've spoken with the Ridget 38 Leadership Committee on several occasions to keep them updated on this project, and the business community has been very receptive um, to the idea of having all these potential customers <laughs> right there. So uh, when we keep our eye on the big prize, uh, we think that this is a really quality project, and this subdivision allows that to happen. So we are strongly in favor of the su subdivision and uh, potentially having to find a new home. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to come forward and speak? Seeing none, I will close the citizens forum. Are there any other questions from the commissioners for the applicants or staff? If not, I would entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to move to approve uh, case number MS-16-08 a request for approval of a two-lot minor subdivision plat property, plat on property zoned mixed-use commercial and located at the northwest corner of West 38th Avenue and Upham Street for the following reasons. One, all requirements of the subdivision regulations, Article 4, of the Zoning and Development Code have been met. Number two, all agencies can provide services to the property with improvements installed at the developer's expense with the following conditions. Condition one, the applicant shall continue to coordinate utility service with the appropriate agencies and any updated information regarding utility easements shall be reflected on the plat prior to recordation. Condition two, the developer shall enter into a subdivision improvement agreement with required security prior to recordation of the subdivision plat. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Call for vote. Motion passed eight to zero. Thank you. We will now move on to other items. The Wheat Ridge Ward Station area visioning update. I do have a few slides, I don't have a lot of formal comments, but given that the composition of this commission has changed over the 10 plus years that we've been working on 
planning for this station area. Um, I thought I'd do a little bit of background just because we haven't talked about this area of town in a while. Um, so again, sort of extensive planning. The first sub area plan was in 2006, was adopted in 2006. So now we're over the 10 year mark of really actively planning here. Um, the vision document that you reviewed, we're not adopting it as a formal sort of amendment to the sub area plan. It's really more of a guiding document. But to come up with a clear vision has really been a priority, particularly since the approval of the 2E ballot question, which will dedicate $12 million of funds for public infrastructure and investment to the station area. So that money comes with a clock, and we have um, for all of the 2E projects, about three years to spend 80% of the funds is sort of the, the rule of thumb. So we have to get moving, um, but we also want to make those investments in a wise and leveraged way. Our sort of internal staff group motto has been to turn 12 million into 50 million. Um, and what we mean by that is using matching grants. So you think about, for example, Wadsworth, um, that 2E fund is about $7 million, but that project is going to be, you know, in the $40, $50 million range. So what we want to do in the station area is sort of the same, leverage this 12 um, to get uh, grants and to get uh, private investment and to really sort of capitalize on opportunities as they come up over the next few years. Um, the trouble that we've had in the last several years is that the plans that we have in place say you know, sort of the traditional TOD vision, um, which is not particularly specific and is very mismatched with what's actually up there. Um, so the purpose here is to sort of help us clarify internally and to other folks that approach us, what do you want up here? What do you see? What investment are you going to make? Um, so just a little bit of background. I think you guys are probably all familiar, but obviously we're the, um, we're the beginning of line station, depending on how you look at it, for the RTD G line, which is the commuter rail um, technology. Same technology as the A line, um, which as you've seen in the news has been plagued by some technical difficulties. The G line, um, RTD feels confident that they'll open this year. Uh, they gave an update to council um, not too long ago and they've been working with the Federal Railway Administration and feel confident that they could start testing on the G line maybe pretty soon. Um, as soon as the A line technology is worked out, then it will be a much hopefully smoother and faster process to get the G line running. Um, but the station is pretty much built. If you've been out there, you've seen the parking lot, um, the street improvements, they had to build a new public street. Um, we'll see that little site plan in a minute, but um, that's all in place. And now we really need to do our job to figure out what else is gonna change from a public and private side up there. So I mentioned the 2006 sub area plan. When we refer to the Northwest sub area, it's this area in purple, so sort of that quadrant from Ward Road over um, to maybe Tabor, um, Ward to Tabor, 52nd to I-70, that purple shaded area. And the reason that we did the 2006 plan was essentially because Fast Tracks got approved in 2004, and if we wanted to have a seat at the table to design this station, we needed to have an adopted plan. So we put something in place really quickly in order to have that seat at the table. And you can see from the graphic, which was the land use map um, at the time, it essentially established this street grid system, which was really good because it did ultimately change the design of the station up there. It was originally sort of on a diagonal, um, which would have interfered with having a nice traditional street grid. So 2006 plan, um, very important, but a little vague, right? Sort of the standard TOD, mixed use, higher density, pedestrian friendly street grid. Um, and we knew we'd have to update it. And in your staff report, we went through sort of the abbreviated timeline of what was done after 2006. So we updated the comprehensive plan, we created mixed use zoning, urban renewal plans got updated. Um, some of you may have been on the board here when the Jolly Rancher property came through and got rezoned. They established a metro district, which would be a financing tool they can use to do some of their infrastructure obligations. Um, so ultimately, we said, okay, we've, we've gotten a lot done, and in 2013, we updated the sub area plan, um, not to change the vision entirely, but really to just capture those accomplishments and the things we'd learned. The station had been designed at that point in time um, to update and create a sort of a more focused um, action item list and to be a little bit more critical of sort of what, what are our needs up here. We updated the graphics. The vision didn't change, and the vision is, you know, it really hasn't changed because it was 
kind of broad to begin with. We've really been focusing on just what do we mean when we say mixed use at the Wheat Ridge Ward Station, because it's probably going to look a little different than the other 70-some fast track stations. Um, so this, again, I mentioned we'll see a little bit of the overlay of what RTD built relative to what's up there today. And as you can see from here, um, it's not your traditional, not right now, your traditional TOD station, right? It's an area of town that is predominantly industrial zoning um, and has been an employment focus for the city. You have, just to orient you a little bit, so this yellow line is the rail line. It's shared with the heavy rail, and that's why we have commuter rail, because it can withstand sharing, being in close proximity to heavy rail. Um, that parallels Ridge Road. Our station is here. Taft Court was um, constructed by RTD. Um, the station platform for the tracks is down here. There are eight bus bays. At the time that the station was designed, it was anticipated that we'd have maybe 16 buses um, coming through. Uh, a few years ago, they realized that they were only going to have one bus coming through. So we've already talked to RTD about an opportunity to better utilize some of that area. It's a big area um, that has been sort of modified for opening day. It'll function as more of a kiss and ride. Um, there's on-street parking, and then just across uh, the street is their parking lot. You may recall that Ridge Road didn't used to go all the way through, so this was 50th place, it dead ended. Um, Ridge Road now goes all the way through and is called Ridge Road all the way to Ward. Um, this large vacant area and these structures, I don't, this is an old aerial, um, it's where Jolly Rancher was, so that's the largest property in the area under single ownership, about 14 acres. Um, what we call the Hans Ranch property, and I think you all have seen the zone change and maybe subdivision for that. Um, plan to be residential, which is a good transitional use to what we have already in terms of lower density, single two family residential. Um, beyond this dotted line is Arvada and unincorporated Jefferson County. But you can tell from sort of the, it's an underutilized area, right? If you look at the amount of buildings compared to the land area out here, there's a lot of opportunity um, to implement more transit supportive land uses, whether it's commercial or multifamily. Um, and so <clears throat> in 2015, the Urban Land Institute, ULI, it's a, it's a professional organization of real estate professionals and developers and finance folks, and they actually approached the city and said, we have this tool called a technical advisory panel, and some of you may have been contacted by them or um, sat in on their presentation, but essentially they said, we, let us come in and, you know, we, it's a problem-solving panel. We want to look at a, an issue around the metro area for two days, put our heads together, staff were not at the table. It was really sort of an outside, professional, market-based opinion of what could happen here. Um, because I think we all agreed that we were sort of struggling to answer the question when a developer came in and said, what do you want here? Um, so that was in 2015, and I'll talk a little bit what their, their recommendations, I think, I summarized in, in the staff report, but essentially they said, be a little bit more open-minded about your commercial land uses, embrace what's out there, think about flex space, think about an innovation hub. They completely supported, and we've long ag agreed that the street grid and um, the sort of physical infrastructure out there should feel more urban. Um, but sort of form over function, right? Care about how it looks and how it's experienced as a pedestrian, but maybe there's an opportunity to embrace some of these more employment-based uses that are out there, industrial uses that are out there, in addition to having your traditional sort of mid to high density residential. Um, so that was helpful feedback. They, they all agreed in that panel that retail is not realistic um, in the short term on this site. Um, and that really it's going to need to be a site that capitalizes on the unique opportunities that we have in Wheat Ridge generally and in this area um, and needs to set itself apart from the other TOD stations that are coming online at the same time that are all competing for developers. Um, so fast forward, last year we talked about $12 million being dedicated to the station area um, and really catalyzing the need for us to get um, even more serious about how we want to identify those infrastructure needs and and refine that vision so that our investment is um, compatible and supportive and catalyzes private investment. Um, so that comes to the 15-ish page vision that we gave you guys as homework to read. Um, and as you could tell from that document, um, it really, it's intended as a communication tool. It's n we don't intend, it's a, it's a wish list, right? It's pretty far-reaching, it's pretty um, aspirational. 
Uh, it's not intended to be restrictive. We don't think all of those things in that document are going to happen, but um, as opportunities arise and we can sort of capitalize on some of those ideas, uh, that's that's the hope. Um, so what WSP is a um, international firm, I believe, um, but they have an office here in Denver. Planners, engineers, um, I think they do they do construction also. But their planners came to us um, and said, "We can let us sort of look at what you've done and help you further that vision." So they looked at all of those past documents that are listed. They did confidential interviews with stakeholders, so we still don't even know everybody that they talked to. Um, and that was sort of the, the intent of that, is that it's not the city coming to talk to you with any specific agenda. Um, they may have talked to some of you, they talked to council members, they talked to developers with knowledge of the area, with, um, they talked to developers who had no idea about Wheat Ridge or our station. Um, and they, they conferred with us on occasion as well, and they came up with that vision plan that you've seen in there. Um, essentially, the feedback that they got was relatively consistent with ULI's feedback in terms of trying to think about this um, outside of the box of the traditional transit-oriented development. Um, and again, reiterating that we are in competition with other TOD areas and stations and what can set us apart um, in good ways. And, and fundamentally, again, sort of leveraging those existing land uses, employment-focused land uses and buildings and the amenities. And I think we know that as a city, um, we have a lot of recreational amenities. We have great parks and trail system and, you know, I think when you talk to a lot of people and businesses who live here, the reason is um, proximity to the mountains and to downtown. And the rail station, I think in particular, builds on that with I-70 access to the mountains and I-70 or rail access to downtown and onto the airport. So the location was seen as a huge opportunity. You know, you have the Clear Creek Trail to the south, the Van Bibber Trail to the north. We just did bike pet improvements on Tabor, so really building some of those um, sort of fundamental bike ped improvements, but what can we do to um, embrace even further recreational theme? Um, I-70, I mentioned, is an opportunity. It's also a barrier. You can't see our station area at all until you're really right on top of it. Um, so we talked a lot about and what those circles and asterisks are in this image is how do you create some excitement and wayfinding gateways and sort of direct people to the station area. Um, the elements of this graphic, it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit rudimentary. You don't get a lot of graphics like this drawn by hand. So I'll walk you through a few of it, and I know a few of the elements. Um, the regional park uh, certainly is one of those ideas that is a big um, commitment. We've been working with the Parks Department, and the Parks Commission will get an update on this plan to here, um, I think, this month. Uh, those lakes, um, the Eastern Lake has been privately owned for years, um, and that gentleman has, a, has long had a vision of doing some sort of commercial enterprise on the northern um, end, and something to sort of capitalize on that lake, whether it's recreational or hospitality-based. Um, the Western Lake was actually owned by the city of Arvada for a really long time, um, and is under private ownership now, has been for a couple of years. That landowner originally bought it with the intention of doing a recreational use. Um, it's a tough site to develop just because um, there's not a lot of access and it's you know it's never been developed. There's a steep slope over here on Ward, um, but it, it could very feasibly be some sort of a private-public partnership to create that as a more recreational function and again to sort of um, bring some excitement and some visibility to the stationery in general. The green um, lines through here are intended to represent the idea of doing some sort of a linear park, so not just a nice multi-use trail, but something that's a little bit more enhanced. I think in your um, packet there was a section view of like what does a linear park look like in terms of a regular sidewalk versus a crusher vine trail, and um, you know you think about those circuit courses where every so often you see like a pull-up bar or something like that. So just a little bit more activated than your traditional bench and sidewalk. Um, the rail itself creates a barrier up here. There's not a lot of ways to get north and south, and it really bisects the sub area, so you can get up on, on Tabor or on Ward. Um, but the station was actually designed very intentionally to reserve room for a pedestrian bridge, if that ever became a reality or a need. Um, so that's shown in here, and I think there's graphics in there about really creating potentially something that's iconic also. Again, focusing on trying to make something a little bit more visible. Um, 
And then from a land use perspective, what we talked about a lot, um, and there is co-working space or a maker space is a term we learned after this um, got created. But you see around town a lot in Denver now, like Galvanize and Industry and Taxi and a lot of these um, innovation hubs that are intended, you know, on the most basic level to just get somebody out of a coffee shop and working in an environment with other entrepreneurs. Um, we toured actually a place called Tradecraft the other day, and it's a construction focused sort of co-working business incubator. They have um, storage. They're hoping to create a space where you can actually do work. So maker space, like if it's a cabinet maker, they can have their witch up there instead of in their garage. So, um, building on the recreational theme, it would be, I think, the pipe dream to have this be um, outdoor rec-focused businesses that could that could come here. We have a meeting scheduled with our local outdoor rec businesses, which when we sat down to think about who's here, there's really a lot. Um, so we've got about 20 businesses that we've invited to come and um, run this idea off of them. Um, not necessarily to get them to move here, but to say, can we brand this area or Wheat Ridge in general as what we've called like base camp and capitalize on what we've got and, and, and the opportunity that we have up here. Um, let's see, I think I have a couple. These images were in the report. So the bridge, activating outdoor space, galvanized, you can see, is a, is a co-working space um, in Denver. What does that park look like? What do those linear trails look like? Um, we asked WSP to sort of weigh in and what they saw as the city's infrastructure needs. Again, knowing that we have this money that we want to spend as judiciously as possible. Um, so I think there's a sheet in there in terms of what their recommendations were um, roughly in priority, but I think uh, we all would agree that we want to use them, um, those funds, in a way that capitalizes on in opportunities as they present themselves. Um, so we're, our staff group is in the middle of um, two studies actually going on. We've engaged a drainage engineer to determine if it's feasible or realistic to do a regional drainage project. The benefit of that being that if you can create a regional drainage, then each individual, par individual parcel doesn't have to dedicate land that could otherwise be developed. Um, there's a cost to that, and we need to make sure that if that was an investment opportunity that we would recover those costs through higher density development. Um, let's see, next step, so I, we did present this to city council and they endorsed it at a study session last month. We're here tonight and then with the Parks Commission later this month. Uh, I think I mentioned the rec related businesses and we've sent out invitations and have been meeting with um, individual large property owners. We're gonna have smaller uh, meetings with most of the property owner, or, yeah, property owners up there. You may recall we've used a block by block meeting format in 38th Avenue and in Wadsworth, where we try to have a smaller group to have a really a more intimate, productive conversation. So those are scheduled um, in May, and then we're actually engaged a graphic designer to try to help brand the area. Um, Base Camp came up, I think, last fall in a city council um, study session, and. Um, so we've got somebody designing some logos. We're gonna do some test groups and see if that catches on at all. But we're really here tonight um, to get your thoughts and, and your questions. And you know, it's an iterative process. It's not gonna be the, the last time we'll be in front of you. You don't have to think of all of your questions tonight. Um, but we wanted to get you up to speed as we continue to sort of work. I think the, the bond funds are gonna be available in the next week, next week. Um, so on the clock. I want to make good, smart decisions and keep you all engaged and informed and help us. Thank, thank you. On the Jolly Rancher piece? They, the owner of that property is not intending to develop it. So that property is on the market. Um, 
they they had intentions of developing that um, before my time, maybe even before the previous sub-area plan. That didn't come to fruition. Um, so they've been marketing that property for a long time. Um, I think I mentioned, you know, this vision is intended, it'd be great if it falls out exactly as it is, but the zoning in place up there would allow sort of a wide variety of uses. Um, so we've had a lot of inquiries over the years for residential uses. We've had some inquiries on residential use that we've said that is just not dense enough to be transit supportive and we're willing to wait. Um, so we've had still inquiries on um, residential, but what we're doing actively now is trying to market the site to see if there's interest in more of the commercial employment flex co-working um, space, but there's no specific plans right now. So it would be Yeah, we, we call it the catalytic site, right? It's the biggest one and it has the potential to make the biggest impact and right. The ULI panel. They didn't have much say about what could be done with that because it was a small fragment. Right. Yeah. I was just curious. Yep, nothing yet, but we we agree. It's a it's a huge opportunity. <laughs> we are. <laughs> he is. <laughs> Commissioner Boone. Um, I really like the idea of um, those two ponds being utilized in a way where. Uh, People can go kayaking and, and submerge themselves in water. I don't think there's a lot of uh, opportunities on the western side of town. I think of Soda Lake as one. Chatfield's way down south, bigger animal in itself, State Park. Um, and Westminster, I don't think Stanley and Hidden Lake, uh, I think there's a lot of privatized issues there and, and not much access. So. I guess walk me through, because I don't really know how it works. Uh, when I drove by earlier, the water levels seemed pretty low. So if, if uh, the city would end up uh, purchasing these, that area and developing, how would that work in terms, is that Clear Creek water? And then how, how, would, how would you sustain water levels? That's a great question. We don't, we don't know a lot about the hydrology there, and I don't know um, we also don't know if it's something where we'd buy it outright or we would work with the property owner who already has a recreation sort of theme in okay. mind. Um, but it, there's a lot of unanswered questions. I think they originally were gravel pits when I-70 was built. Okay. Um, and you may have noticed there's sort of a lot of dirt work going on on the eastern side of things. He's got a fill permit to try to make more developable area. Um, but yeah, we, okay. we don't know those things okay. yet. And another question, uh, kind of that road, that new road that's conceptualized going straight due south from the station to uh, those ponds. Mm -hmm. Do those intersect any current structures or is that kind of a path that crosses property but not buildings per se? Um, this is the road you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. So one. this is Van Gordon, this is Tabor. We've talked about this a little bit, you know, the, the, we tried to stay relatively hands off on the vision and we've talked about whether this would make sense being over here on Van Gordon where there's already a road and some sort of building adjacency to a street. If you can picture it, this is Lake Mont um, and they have a really steep hill on the western side of their property. There's a big grade change in that area. There's, uh, I don't know what's in the way. Sure. There's not, it's not like bisecting right through the middle of buildings. It's along a property line right here. Um, but I think this is, you know, it's up, up for debate still whether it actually makes sense here in theory or if, you know, you, 
do more improvements to where we just did on Tabor, or if you put it on Bing Gordon, or sort of what that looks okay. like. And have there been any kind of in-depth conversations that have, I mean, beyond just initial conversations with property owners on that south side, it looks like you guys have worked with the Hans Ranch a little bit, or at least that seems like they're on board and potentially you have something with Jolly Rancher, but is there any kind of initial movement from property owners who are on board to develop that area um, south? We really haven't had a lot of engagement on the business and property owner side, um, and that's the purpose of the meeting in a week or two. Um, we engaged that area when we updated the sub-area plan in 2013. I think the challenge, you know, I think we all know 38th Avenue is a great example. You get planning fatigue. Um, and I think in, in this area in particular, it was like, we'll believe it when we see it. Right, there's not a rail coming, and then the A line, and sort of like we'll believe it when we see it. So we've we've pretty intentionally not had a lot of conversations up there over the last few years because we didn't have a, a reason. So that's the purpose of the meeting in a couple of weeks to get back in front of them with really something to present and something to get responses on and gauge where people are at. Okay. Yeah. That's it. But uh, yeah, thank you for your like, proactive approach. I don't know. There was an article in Denver Post a couple of weeks ago, and it. Uh, highlighted, you know, the staff's proactive approach compared to some other um, neighboring cities that, that have been more reactive. So thank you for that. Commissioner Mukton. I'm, <clears throat> I'm really impressed with this uh, vision doc. I think it, it, it uh, is pretty comprehensive. Um, I would say, you know, if, if the goal is to brand this as a kind of outdoor gateway um, th that park is definitely priority number one even though it's a lot of people might look at it and say well it's a it's, it's not a revenue source it's a it's a it's a cost center um, if if there's a recreational a, a, a group of different recreational amenities there it's going to attract outdoor enthusiasts there and that's what's gonna, you know, I think bring, bring more attention by the outdoor industry and also by other groups and businesses that wanna be associated with that amenity or that vibe, you know, to, to, to locate there or to have some sort of service there. Um, my one comment would be, or question really, the, in order to really engage this, the cycling, the, the, you know, the different cycling communities, both the commuters um, road cycling enthusiasts, uh, like family, groups of family cyclists who are mo much more casual, and also the mountain bike uh, enthusiasts that you might, you know, that you've talked about maybe wanting to uh, activate through, uh, through an actual, you know, mountain biking park using, park using that terrain. What are the, uh, what, what's the access development going to be like heading, t you know, to the south, you know, down to the trail, also up to the north? up to Van Bibber and Ralston Creek, you know, up in Arvada. Is there, is there some plan uh, being, being put in motion or being kept in mind to, to really make sure that that's a real connection, that you just didn't say, well, you know, from this point, you know, good luck, the, the trail's south, have, have fun. It's, you know, I, I wanna make sure that we've got good um, connection strategies from a cycling standpoint so that, so that you know, if, uh, if a family of four with you know a six-year-old kid who's been on a bike for maybe a year or two, they'll feel comfortable going down Tabor, you know, in a bike lane to get to get to this amenity. Um, so is is that is that consideration something you guys have been looking at too? It, it is. Um, I can't tell you specifically like this is the route that we'd send them, but you may know that the bike and pedestrian master plan is in the process of being updated. It's in a I think sort of draft, final draft form, not adopted yet. And that was specifically one of the feedbacks items that we gave them when we saw the first draft is that we need to be more specific in the TOD area in terms of recommendations. Um, the, we worked with Arvada to do, to look at um, bike ped facilities along Ridge Road. You know, being that, as you pointed out, like to get to Van Berber, that's outside of the city's boundary, but we've really been working to, we had a actually a meeting um, I believe CDOT was there, RTD, Jefferson County, Arvada, us, 
just focus on infrastructure, knowing that it affects sort of all of us and we've all got to be at the table. So we're, we're I hear you, we're working on it. I don't have an answer of sort of what the solution is, but certainly um, if we're going to brand ourselves as recreation, it can't be fragments. It's got to be a connected network. Yeah, I mean, my, my worry would be, you know, if you create this little gem of a, of a park that's got both water and trail right there, you don't want to have it, you, you don't want it to be something that people have to put their bike on a, on a bike rack to get to. You want them to be able to, to bike there because that will engage them to bike to, you know, maybe some retail that's, that's up by the train station or to actually, you know, br bring, their, bring their bikes in uh, you know, via rail, or to go out via rail to to other you know to other amenities, or to connect, say, with North and South Table Mountain if they're a mountain biker, things like that. So definitely stay on top of that because I think that's a really important part of activating that activating that park concept. Commissioner Kimsey. Commissioner Voss. Yes, um, a question as to what is Arvada, if any's participation in the area or monetarily we haven't talked to my knowledge we haven't talked to them about money um i i wasn't in that meeting with the other jurisdictions but i believe we talked about um ward road there it'd be nice to have a signal at where Ro ridge and ward um come together this is a lot of our vada commuters and they acknowledged that so we've sort of set that foundation um, in discussing this signal and discussing Ridge Road and discussing potentially um, a Safe Routes to School grant application on 52nd. Um, so we haven't gotten into that level of detail of who's, who's paying what or what percentage, but um, we've presented that framework to um, want to have a partnership, not just in theory, but financially also. So the a rail line ends in Wheat Ridge and Arvada has no property around that area to climb. What's that? The end of the line, the uh, Ward Road Station has no Arvada touching or usage or they, what? I don't have a boundary map on here. But, oh, okay. Um, oops. Oh, you have it on there. Page which? So it's hard to tell, but this, all of this vacant area is in Arvada. And mm -hmm. then on 52nd, it actually goes back and forth several times between Arvada and unincorporated Jefferson County. So there's three of us on 52nd. And then this is unincorporated Jefferson County. Um, but within this, di this black dashed area, that's all Wee Ridge. That's all Wee Ridge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner mm -hmm. Leo. Yeah, I um, can we get back to that color that uh, vision. the skin, yeah, the schematic that one. I, I I'm looking at it and I know that you had said Tabor and Wood Road would be access to the northern part of north of the tracks, or and south of the tracks. But I just wondered, is there anything in the middle where you get off the train? Is there any way to access the north versus the south? All right now. Is no. there anything that's been, other than a, 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 a bridge, is there anything? No. So basically, if someone were using the northern area for something, they would have to go out to one of the main roads to go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Any other any other questions? No. no. Commissioner Weaver. I think this is fantastic. Um but I was biking from my house the other day to sort of see what this would feel like and there's several barriers south of here too, right south, north, south. Um, and so I, I hope that we can just connect this with the overall bike plan and, um, you know, cause it was interesting being in a car driving down Tabor and over by these lakes and, and it, it has the potential to be such a cool space you know, sort of this hidden, I love the base camp idea. 
Um, but I just hope we can sort of continue and not just sort of drop people off <laughs> at I-70 and Ward, you know. Um, not that it's not a great place, but uh, kind of difficult on a bike sometimes or walking. Thanks. So, so I'm excited. I just had a couple questions and comments. Um, I'm definitely in favor of the pedestrian bridge. As a cyclist, I've gone up some of the pedestrian bridges over by Louisville, and you have to carry your bike up stairs sometimes or get in an elevator. Um, uh, but it's po it's doable, it's possible, and 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 uh, I would be in support of that. And then the uh, having the the lakes in the regional park, I'm definitely in support of that. I grew up in Minnesota, and everybody cherishes the lakes. Um, there's literally houses around every lake. Um, and when I came to Colorado, I was kind of surprised that the lakes I don't feel are quite as cherished. They're kind of you know kind of serve as drainage, and uh, you know if this was Minnesota, there would just be everybody wants a home around the lake because you go fishing, you go boating, you go water skiing. Um, and so I think the vision of having some type of recreation, I think that's great. Um, you know, it, it definitely needs to have when they, I know this is detail, but it definitely ha needs to have sidewalks and pathways going around the lakes and not, not dead spaces. That would be my concern is that we, we only have some walks on the north side and the south side doesn't have any. And then, um, it kind of becomes undesirable, uh, and so there needs to be a lot of activity through there. Um, the one, th uh, one thing I was made aware of, I think, in the past six months was that, um, I don't know the details of it, but there was an, a large outdoor convention in Utah, and politics changed, and they are no longer going to be hosting it in Utah, and I know Colorado has kind of come up, and you know what would that mean? Well, it would mean, I think, more recreation, uh, retail and so I think the timing is good for that um, one uh, one of the things and this is more of a, a personal thing is that I would love someone to have an idea of like hey this was the Jolly Rancher factory so when we start when they start moving forward with a design to pull in some of those beautiful colors to try to identify this ward station there's such an opportunity to, you know the, those translucent colors um it's it's got a lot of history and and uh you know that would be really interesting i think and i can't imagine somebody would not say this is this is the great idea you know to really make that an interesting space um one of the things you did mention was uh it sounded like you were talking about form based code um and is that is that something the you know, for the, maybe this the site is that something that that the city is thinking about? Um, I would say that we tend to think of our mixed use code as a relatively form based code. You think about that use chart compared to the like C one use chart; it's, mm -hmm. it's much more abbreviated, and we have really high architectural standards. We've toyed with an overlay district, but it's literally as far as we thought of. Do we need an overlay district for any reason, use or design? Um, which would essentially just be regulations that apply just based on this being a certain geography. Um, but we haven't, we haven't gotten too much further on that. I mean, one of the things we probably do need to start thinking about, depending on who was to maybe come in the door, is, um, as you all know, the mixed-use design standards are very rigorous. And if, we, if you tend to start going towards a more employment, flex-based user, can they afford to develop for their use with their pro forma based on our regulations and can we still achieve a really cool sort of urban form with maybe a different type of architecture. So we, it's on the radar, but um, we haven't talked much very specifically about like, what, what do we mean by form based? Mm -hmm. There's also some very interesting, um, I don't know what to call it, food areas that are occurring in the Metro Denver area. I just went to the Stanley Marketplace, which is something that's new um and it was it was interesting it was a it was a small pedestrian type feel it had a lot of food spaces a lot some retail and then it had a second story but the it was the the scale that impressed me as opposed to the typical shopping mall where you have a pretty good stretch to get from one side to the other this was very tight and this was a reuse project um in that area and so that uh you know kind of thinking outside the box i guess uh, of trying to have something um 
in some area. And then I know that one of the things I sent uh, the other the commissioners was um, what I've seen is the these uh, kind of the new things, these pop up retails, and they're not a pop up as far as uh, uh, a retail that is a standalone. It's more that is there any? I just I just wanted to ask. I guess is there anything in our zone that would prevent um, some of these? these retails that might go into space for like a week and then they're gone and then something else goes in. Is there anything that would prevent something like that? I don't think so. I mean, they need to get a business license. Right. A quick turnaround. And okay. When you think about like uh, Four Seasons, um, farmer's market is sort of intended for some sort of people to maybe come and go. So you create a vendor space that can mm -hmm. allow that. And on a more extended level, I'm thinking of like Avanti where I think those restaurant users have a one year lease. So it's intended to sort of right. turn over. Um, yeah, it's a cool idea. And then there's another one. Uh, I don't think it's even been built yet, but I've seen the drawings in the in the Denver area where they've made a large outdoor space, but it's all um, containers. I, I can't think of the name of that one. I don't think it's even built yet, but uh, it's a it's just a really interesting space to get the space energized um, and, and uh, you know th that kind of uh, you know food truck type. Um, so I. I just, uh, I think this is going in the, I feel like this is definitely going in the right direction. And, and uh, you know, I think, um, I, I appreciate that you're reaching out to the, the planning commission and uh, for some feedback. Does anybody else have any other comments or questions? I just had one. Um, thinking about the Jolly Rancher theme, uh, I'd also recommend advocating for uh, generating a, a different candy smell every day. <laughs> like they used to do because I honestly really miss that <laughs> I grew up near a um, oh my god Keebler factory so I understand that nice the smell creates gather memories I will say one They closed that when it transacted, yeah, but I do recall that just a year or two ago, I think it closed. I 
I think the last comment I, I want to make is that, uh, and somebody else can talk after me, but that um, I'm not really worried that this is not going to get developed. I think the problem right now that I see is the G line isn't moving. Once the G line is moving and people realize, like, oh, there's, you know, I could live out here and commute to there. Other places down the on the other stations, those will get filled up first, and this is going to be the the little gem. So. Well, it is. I mean, you look along the, uh, uh, the line that goes out to Gold. Uh, Lakewood there. Uh, every station stop now has some type of housing. You mm -hmm. know. something going there. Right. Yeah, we're going to have to use every tool in the toolbox up here. And I think to a comment you just made, what we've heard a lot from de the development community is that transit is the icing on the cake. It's not the only reason somebody's going to develop out here. Um, and so it's having sort of these other tools and um, leveraging capacities and the vision that will get them out here and the transit that will sort of sl seal the deal. Um, so I would, I would agree with sort of all of your optimism that it's not if, it's when, and just sort of being able to capitalize on the opportunities when they when they come up to get this area. Did a good presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, I think, yeah, I think we're about ready. Did, did anybody in the audience want to, did you want to comment at all or? Okay. Okay. Thank you. If there are no other items. Let's. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. Second. Discussion. Call for a vote. Motion passed eight to zero. Thank you.